Hello, thank you for joining us at the Vine Church um, for a time of worship. I'm Jim Richter. I'm the pastor here at the Vine, and I would love to get to know you. You can email me at pastorjim at onthevinechurch.com. Would love to hear your prayer requests, any questions you have about the Vine, and um, just get to know you better. Um, so we would love it if you would join us for worship sometime. Um, this coming Sunday um, is the last Sunday in that we will be at the Education Building at Mount Olive Lutheran Church, 3950 Leonard Street Northwest. Um, we will be having worship at 10 a.m. at the Ice and Fitness Center, Walker Ice and Fitness Center, for the next three Sundays. So August 1st, August 8th, August 15th. And then August 22nd, we're so excited. We are uh, going to be worshiping every Sunday at 10 a.m. at a new home. It's Adventure Point Camp. It's, and uh, um, it's on the intersection, the northwest corner of Walker Road and I-96. So really close to those of us who live on the northwest side and Walker and actually anywhere in Grand Rapids. It's, it's on I-96, the northwest corner. And we'll be worshiping in the DeVos Family Center for Scouting. Um, brand new facility, it's beautiful, 30-acre uh, camp. So we would love it if you would join us 10 a.m. on Sundays in that new location or the next three Sundays at the Walker Ice and Fitness Center. Uh, today we wanna lift up uh, our prayers to God. Um, uh, we wanna worship Him and uh, I, I know our digital worship right now doesn't have music, and um, we are so excited that the Lord has called a new uh, worship leader and family life minister to the vine, to the vine, Matt Heyer, and Matt will begin with us on August eighth. So we're very excited for that, and we'll be able to reincorporate our uh, a few sets of songs for you to sing at that time. But today we just turn our hearts to God and. And we, we worship him. And so I invite you to pray with me at the end of our prayers today. We'll, we'll say together the Lord's Prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are the one God, the one true God. And we give you praise and honor and glory today. Lord, as the angels um, gathered around you, we hear them in Scripture singing, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so, Lord, we bow before you. You are worthy of our honor and praise. You are holy and perfect beyond our understanding, powerful beyond our understanding, wise beyond our understanding. You're always with us. You know all things. God, we can go on and on about your attributes. But today, Lord, the greatest attribute that we ascribe to you is love. Lord, you have shown us your profound loving, giving us your one and only Son, our Savior Jesus, to come to this world and do what we can to as sinners. He lived perfect. And then, Lord, he died as a sacrificial lamb to take away all the sins of all the world. And so, Lord, today we turn to you repentant and needy, and we receive your love and forgiveness. We praise you, Father. And, Lord, you are Savior. There is no other God, and there is no other Savior. And so today we call upon you, O King and Lord of our lives and the universe, to hear our cries. There are people today that are worshiping that need your help, Lord. They are struggling with sin and they need you, Jesus, to help, to deliver, and to forgive. Lord, there are people who are struggling with illness of body and mind, physical and emotional. And so we pray that you would bring them healing. God, we lift up before you those struggling in relationships. Lord, where there is anger and bitterness, brokenness, hurt, that you would bring your forgiving love, your Holy Spirit, a supernatural love and forgiveness, that you would reconcile two parties together, that you'd bring your peace. Lord, there are people with questions, uh, questions about work, questions about being an employer or an employee. 
God, we lift up before you these requests and we ask for your Holy Spirit and your wisdom and your word and your clear guidance in the lives of your people. Lord, we pray today for our nation, for President Biden and all who serve in positions of authority. God, that you would um, give wisdom and integrity. God, where, where anything unjust is done behind closed doors, that you bring everything into the light, that you would in every way, Lord, um, be just and keep peace in our land so the gospel can go forth and people might be saved and you might come again soon. Lord, we lift up these prayers and there are many other prayers on our heart and we pray them today with the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today we are continuing our series, Called Out. That phrase, called out, is the literal translation for the word church in the New Testament of the Bible. Ekklesia is the Greek word, and it, it simply means called out. And it's talking about the church, God's people, who have repented and believed this good news about Jesus as their Savior and forgiver of sin and their Lord and leader and King, about us who follow him out of the dominion of darkness, Satan's kingdom of sin and death and destruction, and into the kingdom of the Son, Jesus, and life and love. It, this series, we, we've looked at, um, we're looking at 12 characteristics of Jesus' church, this church that the gates of hell will never prevail against. Um, and Jesus is, it's going to be standing when Jesus comes again. The vine is a new church, and we want to be that kind of church. We're on point uh, of 12 characteristics, characteristic nine today, and it's worship, life, life, not just as we gather together, as we, we, we focus our hearts and our minds on Jesus today, um, but life is worship. It, we, we, we have gathering times. God has taught us that through the scripture. Jesus, he gathered with God's people every Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. But what, as we, we focus on God and, and remember he's the center of life, and meaning and purpose, everything, then, then our life worship flows from that center and all of life is worship. And so today we want to look at Psalm 95 together. It's, we could look at so many. The, the Bible is a book of worship everywhere. We see people of faith worshiping. But we're going to look at Psalm 95 if you have a Bible, I invite you to open it. I'm going to uh, kind of like read it and um, then we're going to break it down and then we'll have some points to, to look at, to, to meditate on. Uh, again, I want to remind you that in the description section of the worship video today, there is an outline that's, that's printed there for you. You can follow along. There's lots of extra scriptures that you can look up and meditate on. I encourage you to do that. But Psalm 95 O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his. For he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are his people, the sheep of his hand, uh, the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the, in, the, in the wilderness, when our fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So life is worship. Um, today, I, uh, as we begin this um, kind of message on worship, uh, I remember one of the oldest uh, story, preacher stories in the book that's uh, about the, the boy that was in worship with his parents and the pastor lifted up a tragedy where a soldier was um, killed in the line of duty, killed in service. And the little boy, as he's leaving worship that day, goes to the pastor and he says, Pastor, I just wanted to know if that person died in the first service or the second service. And so, you know, we, we have this, uh, it, it's funny because sometimes, you know, worship gets long. Um, the, 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 our focus isn't right. Sometimes the music isn't great. Sometimes the sermon is long and maybe not great. Um, and so sometimes we, we see this formal setting of worship, you know, the hour, hour and a half that God's people gather, you know, often on a Sunday morning um, as, as worship. And we kind of box worship in, in that place. And it, 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 it was never meant to be that way. Number one, if worship isn't exciting, that's our fault. Not, not God's or maybe even the experience. You know why? Because if we're in the presence of God and we're focused on God, that will never be boring. So um, I uh, remember visiting with my grandma. Now, my, my grandma Schneider, she lived to be 101 years old. And I remember going to visit her when she was about 99. Now, grandma was um, grew up as a Baptist, going to church pretty much every Sunday. And Grandpa was Presbyterian, so my mom was raised in the Presbyterian church. So Grandma was a, a worshiper. And when she was 99 years old, and, and she, I'm a young pastor, and Grandma has all these questions. And, um, and one of the questions was, she said, I just love being here. You know, I know that when we go to heaven, you know, there's no crying tears or pain, but, you know, being in worship all the time just sounds boring. That was my 99-year-old grandma. Um, we had a little talk. First of all, being in that heavenly worship, if you read the book of Revelation and you see what's going on, read 5, 6, and 7 of Revelation today if you have time. It is not boring. It is engaging. And God is greater and more beautiful and um, worthy of glory more than we can ever imagine. Um, as we see this heavenly worship take, take place, um, Ezekiel, Isaiah, it's not boring. Um, and it's not meant to be, but, but, but see, this worship where we get refocused and recentered, where God is at the center and we're not, where God is the one who rules and we don't, where God is the king of our life on the throne and we aren't, when we get recentered, it just flows into the rest of life. And God fills our life with rest, peace, joy, meaning. And that's what it's meant to be. So let's look at Psalm 95. Just if you have your Bible open, just walk through this with me. I want to think through this psalm, and, and then we'll have some points to share. First, the Lord Yahweh in this psalm is lifted up as king of the universe. 
His throne and his gracious rule is seen at the center of all creation. And the members of the congregation of God's people invite one another to the great privilege of worshiping the Lord, the one and only God, the great king above all gods. God is the king of creation. Creation is his. He made it. He rules over it. Creation is pictured as being in his hand. And he is just absolutely in total control over it. The center of the psalm gets to the heart of worship. It's a confession of faith in a personal God with wonder and awe. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. There is marvel in these words of being God's people. The people of such a majestic and awesome king, a king who has pledged himself to care for the people, making them the sheep of his hand. I, I used to love the picture of, um, of Jesus, you know, holding a lamb with lambs around him and the shadow of, of the valley of the shadow of death is behind him, but there's a little lamb in his arm. And that's the picture here. We are a uh, people with a personal shepherd who holds us in his hand. And then the worship of God's people flow from that. It's an authentic, heart-filled worship. It's exuberant. There's singing, there's joyful noise, there's clapping, there's shouts, there's spontaneous thanksgiving, there's sacrifice, there's silence, there's wonder, there's a humble bowing, kneeling down of the whole person. It's the whole person engaged in worship, mind and heart and spirit and body. So then the psalm shifts. You see, in the instructions given to Moses about, about worship in Exodus and Leviticus, the people are taught to hear the word. There's a time of reading the scriptures and a priest expounding on them. And in the psalm, there's this urgent plea. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the days of Massa and Meribah. The word Massa means testing. The word Meribah means Quarreling, And the story is about Massa and, and Meribah is recorded in Exodus 17, 1 to 7. You can look it up later today. But God's people had just experienced the great deliverance of the Exodus and the Passover and walking through the Red Sea. And now they're on the way to Sinai for this great covenant with the Lord where God will promise to be their God and they will promise to be his people. They're going to learn uh, reverence and worship. They're going to be given the commandments of God and they get to walk in the, in the presence of God who's going to lead them into the promised land. Along the way, immediately after the Red Sea, there's a shortage of water. And the people quarreled and said to Moses, give us water. And as if God was going to leave them now, after all the plagues and, and the Passover, and after, you know, leading them through the Red Sea and crushing the whole Egyptian army, now God's going to leave them? But the people lose faith. And Moses was, was commanded by God to strike a rock, and water flowed from it, and and in that, we see a picture, of course, of Jesus and, and the, the striking of Jesus on the cross and the water and blood that flowed from it. There's a great 
Christian song that is derived from that rock of ages. Um, and, uh, but it reminds us that Jesus is the, the rock from which provision comes, water of life. And so um, there's a, a stern call. Um, at the end of this scripture, there's this verse, and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? See, that phrase is the opposite of worship. The heart and center of worship is faith. And, 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 and worship flows naturally, exuberantly from a heart of faith. You want to be in worship corporately. You want to be in worship personally, in the word, in prayer, in singing. You want to be in group. You want to be in worship in your life. Giving God glory for breath and provision and protection and leadership. At the heart of worship is faith. And where there's not worship or you don't want to worship, there's a weakness of faith. Is the Lord among us or not? Is the question. And in Psalm 99, there's a stern admonition. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. To harden your hearts means to make them dull and unresponsive to God, thus strengthening that unbelief and grieving the Holy Spirit within us. The psalm warns that those who harden their hearts and unresponsive to God's voice will never enter his rest. That's the stern word that the psalm ends with. So God calls us to rest. And if we look at Hebrews 4, we see that it's a call to Jesus, to the rest and forgiveness that Christ has won, to the leadership that Christ brings, to following him in a life of, of Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, following him in a life of rest as we depend in faith on God and celebrate in faith God. So that's the psalm. That's the psalm. It's it's a, it's a call to worship. It's a call to faith in God. God at the center. And, and that's the picture I want you to think of today. Um, is God at the center? You know, our solar system has the sun at the center and then planets that circle around the sun. Our problem, people is that we put ourselves at the center of life. We trust ourselves, and then we bear this huge weight. That's why God gave us a Sabbath day, a day to remember that He is God and we are not, a day to remember that He is God who provides us with all our rest. And, and, and so that's the picture that God restores and renews us with as we enter into worship. And we live our lives as people with a heart of faith. So just why do we worship? We were created to worship. The psalm says, oh, come, let us worship. And um, in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 and 12, it says a phrase there, we were created for the praise of his glory. You see, man is made for worship. There's a a, a God-sized hole in all of us that only God can fill. And if we don't have God at the center, the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who gave His Son in love to us to save us, to bring us into relationship for now and forever, if we don't have God at the center, then something else is going to take that us, we're going to trust ourselves, or money, or sex, or power, or drugs, or alcohol, Something's going to be at the center, and our life will revolve around that. You know, one of the great stories about that is the story of the woman at the well. If you remember that story, um, in John chapter 4, there's this 
Samaritan woman and Jesus is is on his way back from festival in Jerusalem and he he goes through Samaria and he's visiting with a Samaritan woman and he asked the woman he's at a well Jacob's well and he asked the woman for a drink and the woman says well, why do you a Jew ask me a Samaritan woman for a drink and Jesus says if you knew who were asking you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water and uh, and the woman spars with Jesus are you greater than our father Jacob and Jesus says to her everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst again the water that I will give him will become for him a spring of water welling up to eternal life that's John 4 13 through 14 think of this there is nothing that will fill your soul but Jesus. Jesus, the Savior, the Lord of the universe, the physical manifestation of God, the very God, the image of God that he has given to the world. Jesus, only he will fill your spirit, your soul, your life, so that you don't thirst for more. And um, so the woman <laughs> asked Jesus for some of this water, and he says, go get your husband, and I'll give you some. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right, you, you, you don't. The man you're living with, now, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. See, that woman was going to a well. She had something, she had sex or, or, or wanted to be loved or, or not lonely. Something was at the center of her life. And it was driving her, and it was creating not satisfaction, but more thirst. And that's the way it is for people when anything is at the center of our lives but the true God. You know, um, I invite you to read Romans 1, 18 through 32. There it talks about a people, and it is so relevant to where the world is at in our day. It talks about a people who exchange the truth of God for a lie, and they worship and serve creators, created things rather than the creator who is to be praised forever. Read it. It's all about the world we live in. Romans 1, 18 through um, 32, actually. And there you will see the destructive world we live in because God is not at the center. See, anything that takes the place of God, money, things, sex, power, prestige, anything, that takes the place of God will cause incredible destruction and dysfunction in our lives. And so God calls us to something better. He calls us to worship him. Oh, come, let us worship. The psalm goes on to teach us why we worship. We were redeemed to worship. That's the story of God's people redeemed from slavery in Egypt, ultimately by the blood of the Passover lamb, rescued then from the Egyptian army through the water of the Red Sea. And think about our lives. We have been, have been rescued from slavery from, to sin, death, and hell through the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the world. We have entered into the glorious freedom of God through baptism. God put his name on you, made you one of his people, 
in the, the psalm, it cries out, the Lord is a great God, a king above all gods. Oh, come, let us worship for our, he is our God. And we, we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? God chose you, a sinner, a wayward wandering lamb to be his precious lamb. To be the, one of the sheep of his hand. He holds you close. He knows you personally. Can you believe it? God, that God is worthy of worship. I love in the book of Revelation, as we are gathered in worship, it, I invite you to read Revelation 5, 9 through 12. They sing a new song. Do you have a new song in your heart today as one of those redeemed by the blood of the Lord? They sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seal, O Lamb of God. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. There, nothing shall touch us. We are victorious in Christ no matter what is swirling around us. We're the free people of God, and God is our King. Jesus is our Lord. He's a Savior. We reign on earth even though all hell is breaking loose around us. And then John says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands upon ten thousands, saying in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Why do we worship? We're redeemed. If you don't have that in your heart, then you're not free yet. You know, we, we, we go back to that, that, that word that we, we, we spoke earlier, um, a word of doubt. Oh, don't doubt God's love. Don't doubt his presence. Don't doubt his power. Don't doubt his plan. If we look 2,000 years to Calvary, we know God gives us a word. It's a word that says, I love you. I forgive you. I'm on your side if you have repented and trusted me. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so we are filled with the Holy Spirit for constant worship. Our Psalm 95 says, For he is our God, we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. One of the beautiful gifts of being God's children is his Holy Spirit. No one says Jesus is Lord except by the power of his Spirit. Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he talks about worship. She says, well, the Samaritans worship on this mountain. The Jews worship on that mountain. What, what, what is worship? And Jesus says these words, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, you know what Jesus is saying? He is saying that he's with us always, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in us because he redeemed us with his precious blood. He cleansed us and he, as a, a believer, deposited his spirit in us. There is not a moment that we don't worship because we're in faith in him. It's that quenching water in John chapter 17, after he told the woman that he was the water that, that would quench, Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he, had, he said this about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to 
receive. And he poured that spirit out on Pentecost. Why do we worship? Because God is our God. And he's worthy. And we've been brought back into a relationship with him. It flows from within us. I, I love the scripture where, where, where Moses is growing in his relationship with God. And, and you know, initially when Moses saw um, experienced God at the burning bush, he pulls his cloak up and he's gonna feels like he's gonna die because he's in the presence of God. And now, as he's gotten to know God and his relationship has grown, he says, God, show me your glory. And ultimately, the Lord passed by him, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, the great I am. I'm, I, I always have been, I always will be, but I am present with you to save the God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, patient, abounding in steadfast love. It's like a waterfall that never ends. His love is as high as the heavens are above the earth. He removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. He keeps his steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but will by no means clear the guilty. He's just. He's holy. He's coming to judge. He visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God is worthy of our worship. He's the Father who loves us as dearly loved children. He's the Son who came and laid down his life to purchase us back from sin, death, and Satan, to make us God's children. He's the Spirit. He's not far away. He's near. He's God, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And how do we worship? Well, the scripture is clear. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth, not with lips only, not with outward signs only, not with, not with just mind only, but a people who worship him with mind and body and heart of faith. Paul is talking about that in Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. From a time of worship corporately, a time of worship privately around the word and in prayer, from a time of worship flows a life of worship. You know, God's people are filled with actions. See, we, we are a people who know that God, almighty creator of the universe, is at the center. We are not. He is Lord and King. We are not. We repent of, of trying to take charge and trusting ourselves and not him, of pride and of selfishness. And remember that he is God and deserves glory. Not me, not you. That's why we do things. Our, our bodies are living sacrifice. We, we want to displace the gods in our life. So the idols of sex and pleasure, what do we do? We prioritize a time of worshiping together corporately. We prioritize life group, a small group where we get together, we prioritize the word of God. We displace the idols of money and things by tithing and giving offerings to show that God is first and center in our lives, not our money, not ourselves, not our pleasure. We displace the idols of prestige and power pride by serving for the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many god is at the center friends oh come let us worship i think about god 
when he created the world and after six days of creation, he rested on the seventh. The Bible teaches us that he set that day apart as special and sacred. So what's God doing on the, the, does he really need rest? No, he's looking at his creation. He's looking at you and me and he's saying, it's very good. It's beautiful, it's good. That's who we are in Christ. And then we, understanding this great creator, God is at the center, we speak back, God, back to him. God, you're good. You're great. You're beautiful. You're our hope. You're, you're our future. You're everything. That's what the Vine Church wants to do. I pray that's what you want your life to be all about. Please pray with me. God, we give you praise for worship. You made us to worship and you made us to worship you. You created us. You redeemed us. And you sanctify us. You fill us with your Holy Spirit for a life of worship. God, forgive us where we not, have not treasured or valued worship, where we, where we haven't lived out of a life of faith. Forgive us for unbelief. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus who took your wrath and punishment for all the unbelief and sin and of mankind on the cross. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus who lived a perfect life of worship and faith. Forgive us, God, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Make us a holy temple that worships you at all times and brings worship of you for your glory to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. So grateful to worship with you today. Hey, I would love to get to know you. You can email me at Pastor Jim at onthevinechurch.com. If you have any questions about where we're going to be worshiping at in the, the month of August, I love those emails. Pastor Jim at onthevinechurch.com. God bless you. Give you a great day in the Lord.